really want to get my heart more into God is He's my Father. Amen. He's my Father. He's the Father that He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Uh, you may think others may abandon you, but He's right there. He's the constant, constant presence. He's your Father. He loves you. He wants to unfold your plans. Yes, Lord. So, uh, Chris can help me. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take communion. If somebody has a verse in regards to communion, mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear them. But Chris, if you could, uh, he may need some help, but there's a little uh, communion uh, element. Uh, there's more there underneath uh, that black table. Does anyone else have a verse in regards to communion? Does anyone else have a thought in regards to communion? by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He has borne our griefs and our sorrows, smitten by God and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, but by his stripes we are healed, and we are like sheep on a stray. Then by a lamb to the slaughter, and he is pleased by the Lord to bruise him, put him to grief. That passage he just read is 53. From Isaiah, right behind us, a big billboard behind us. Isaiah 53, 1 through, 1 through 6, 5 through 6. Anyone else? Um, I would just say that uh, the cup that he took for us was a cup of suffering. And as we partake, um, we're partakers of the suffering. And he told his disciples that the world will hate you because they hated me. And I just pray that anybody who's deciding to follow after Christ, that you'll understand that the world is going to hate you because they hate Christ. And it goes against everything that they're doing. And I just pray that we would count that suffering joy. And that we would remember these times of communion that we share with the Lord when we are suffering. When we are suffering. That He suffered. And He suffered more than we can ever suffer. Thank you. Jesus tells you, he goes, when you do suffer, as if, uh, you will suffer for following him, he goes, but rest assured, I have overcome the world, and so will you. I want you to take that promise also to uh, your time this afternoon. Hey, I suffer, he suffered, but he says, you're going to overcome, whatever that is, yeah. through that suffering process. Anyone else, in regards to communion, then we'll, we'll uh, drink the blood which is great juice. Anyone else? <laughs> All right. Well, Lord, again, thank you, Lord. And uh, as you are right here, in a sense, I see you uh, through our eyes of faith, and I know that you are pleased because we're doing this in remembrance of you, Lord. And so be pleased with uh, our time right now, Lord. And thank you for the blood. And as somebody said earlier, you will come again soon. Thank you. All right, the body. Uh, this little waffle. Uh, I heard. Uh, I heard during the time of war, the Korean War, that the chaplains would go and take communion with the soldiers. So they couldn't go out to a monastery. They couldn't find a chapel. They were getting 
there in the middle of wartime, and chaplains would go and serve communion to believers right there in the war torn uh, areas at that time. And so uh, we're here. We're going to take remember Jesus' body. Amen. And uh, anyone has a prayer to Jesus they want to thank him to? Penny, Sister Penny? Yes, sir. <laughs> would you like to? say something that yes sir thank you heavenly father lord jesus thank you for giving us the opportunity to have remembrance of you lord jesus and taking this body in remembrance of you lord lord we know that you are almighty god and you are here in our presence lord jesus and you are a mighty healer lord jesus and yes we do believe by your stripes we are healed we are healed remember we have to have that faith lord we believe in you lord jesus and I am a believer then more than any, Lord Jesus, and I know that you are here with us and you are going to be with us, Lord Jesus. And when we take this, let us always remember you every day, day and night, Lord Jesus. You are always there for us. And thank you, Lord, for letting us have this reminder in your body, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Where's our friend Barbara? Barbara's going to lead us in worship. Barbara, you may do the sound. Uh, the Lord is so good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. He is taken down. Remember, I'm sorry. he's wonderful. He wants to. He, he just doesn't want to hear Bar. I think Barbara's okay with me saying this. God just doesn't want to hear Barbara's voice. By the way, God wants to hear your voice. Amen. Jesus wants to hear from you as you cry out to Him, you praise Him, Amen. and you show Him some homage, some Amen. honor this morning. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, God. Well, thank you, Lord, for sending the chaplains out and the helicopters to be in Vietnam. They would bring me the communion, too, and they risked their lives to bring the, the communion to us maybe once a month in the field in Vietnam. Check, 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 one, two. Great reminder, Peter. Wow. Testing one, two, three. Check, one, two. Also, while she's checking her uh, sound, uh, 10 o'clock every Sunday morning, for those of you, uh, Peter Kayser is putting in the work for a Sunday morning uh, study time. So that's Peter. If you're interested, 10 o'clock. And I actually like the idea because that gives some of you a reason to get here a little early and help set up. So. Check on two. Check. Testing one, two, three. Check, one, two. Check, testing, one, two. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Such a blessing to be here today. This first song is called, What a Beautiful Name. I hope that you all would worship with me today. Thank you. 
next one is called Great Are You, Lord.
last song is called Grace in the Gardens. It's one of my favorites to sing. Thank you. 
the throne today. Um, <laughs> I would encourage you, um, we have an agape box and we have a prayer request box too. So if your heart is pulling you to both of them or one or the other or anything, I just, I inspire you and I encourage you to give because this church is amazing and God is so good. Amen. Thank you. Nobody means nobody because who he is. You're under his protection plan. You're under his blood. Uh, he reigns forever. And the Bible makes it so many different passages that he rules the invisible world and the visible world. Colossians. He rules both departments. So I just want to encourage you is that whether it's time of praise and worship, lift up your voice to him, uh, serve him. Talk to him because he, like uh, Francis Chan wrote a book, Crazy Love, he really loves you a lot. Each one of you, wherever you're at on your journey, he loves you and he's after you. So, Nick, thank you for inviting so many people. Praise <laughs> God. Thank, thank you for so many people coming. <laughs> back off what pastor was saying right now um he loves you he loves you he truly loves you uh matter of fact today we're going to go over a chapter uh genesis chapter three i'm actually going to jump in it pretty quick because there's a whole lot in there and I, i'm going to tell you right now i can't do it justice in the amount of time that we have today i can't do it justice in the amount of time that we have this week i can't do it justice in the amount of time that i have this month so um, if we start heading over there, uh, we're going to do that. But we're going to show God's love through this. Because this chapter is known to many as the fall of man. As a split between the creator and his creation. But we'll start to realize that God works out all good for those who love him. And so it's really going to show in this chapter. So... Father God, I thank you for this moment, Father. I thank you for everyone that you brought, Father. It truly is a blessing. I thank you for what you're doing here in this city. Matter of fact, this state, this region, this, this country, Father, I thank you because you are still in charge. And if everything may look like it's falling apart, we know that you are in charge. And that's all that matters. Right now, I just ask that I decrease and that you flow out of me, Father. I ask that you plant a seed here today. And you let it take good root, Father. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. So like I said, uh, if you guys want to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we're going to go through it. There's a whole lot here. And I'm only going to hit a couple things. One being the, uh, the enemy, the serpent. Uh... Some of his tactics, you know, I read a book a while back, uh, The Art of War by Song Ku something, but it's actually a book that's read by many generals in different armies throughout different countries. It's the art of knowing your enemy. You know, when I used to play football uh, back in the day, my superstar days, uh, <laughs> we used to watch hours of film of the team that we we're playing the next week. There's something about a tactic of knowing how your enemy works. So I will through look, at least try to look through many perspectives, one being the enemy, others being angels, and, and try to visualize, try to paint a picture of what's going on here. I'm only gonna focus mainly on three scriptures. If you guys got a highlighter or something, maybe you wanna underline them, it's gonna be 15, Genesis 3, 15. I believe that is a declaration, and I believe that's God's first promise, and it isn't to us, it's to the enemy. Uh, Genesis 3, 21. I believe in the long run, that, that will show compassion. That will show no matter, even through the sin, God still covers us. And then 23, 
Genesis 3.23, which is going to be the split from man and God. So um, I'll start into it. Now the serpent was most cunning of the wild animals that the Lord had made. Wait, before I even start, let me stop a second because I want to catch you guys up real quick. Let me catch you guys up, okay? The book of Hebrews te teaches us, by faith we believe that God created all things through word of mouth. He created the heavens and the earth by word. He brought forth light by word. He said, let there be light, and there was light. See, by word, God created, God produced, God separated, and God um, extended. That's what God did. See, he created all this before he started to create his most prized creation yet. And that was man. That was man. You know, God created man out of the dust of the earth. He formed man out of the dust of the earth. And he said, let us create him in our image. So you are created in the image of God. I want you to understand that. God created man in his image. And what God did is God put man in a piece of paradise. A piece of paradise. Something similar to, I believe, heaven down on earth. It was called Eden. He put man into Eden, and he, he gave man dominion to reign over that territory. See, man had all the trees that there were, all the plants. He was able to name the creatures of the sea, the wild animals, everything. They said, I can't even do this justice explaining it. But there were multiple rivers that ran through this, but he felt man was still missing one thing. So what he did is, out of man, he created woman so that they two would at one point become one. They would become one. And he said you could have anything, anything in this land except one thing. Except one thing. And how often are we as human intentions? We see it now. It's like we don't really realize what we have until we go after that one thing and all that we have is no longer there. And it, it, it happens now. And I'm going to tell you why it happens now. Because God, the God we serve is a just God. So for every action, there's a reaction. And we have to understand that in life. So right now, we're, they're in the garden, man and woman. Matter of fact, they're naked in the garden and they feel no shame. They feel no shame. They're living life to the fullest at this point of life. And this is going to be the introduction of the evil one, the serpent, the one we're going to get to know right now. Like I said, we really need to get to know our enemy. Okay. Now the serpent was the most cunning of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit off from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat, eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at. And that was a desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of his fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. And I'm going to pause for a second right there. because Ladies, cover your ears. I need to talk to the guys right now. I really need to talk. No, no, no. I need to talk to the guys right now. Okay. Okay, look, the, the, the serpent came, this enemy came, and first he questioned. He had her try to doubt. He, did God really say you could eat from any of the trees? Made her think about it. Then, then he lied to her. He's like, no, that's not what God was saying. See, the truth of the fact is, if you eat it, you're going to become like God. And then, and then, and then she started to look. She started to look. The appetite started to grow in her. 
She looked at it, seen that it was desirable, so she wanted some. She ate. See, this is why I got to talk to the guys, because she just passed it to us, and we ate. Okay? I don't know about you guys, but why? We need to put up a fight, okay? We can't be doing everything our wife says. I'm sorry to say that. I hope Elena's not listening, but uh, we can't be doing everything our wife says. But those right there are some of the tactics of the enemy. He will have you question. He will have you doubt. He will lie to you. He would make you think that that's better than what it really is. He'll make you think that that's not what God wants of you. It happens so often. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering from themselves. And that, that happens today. As soon as we trip up, as soon as something happens, we try to cover it up ourselves. Trust me, I know I lived the life. I, I tried to cover up many of my mistakes and realized that I couldn't do it. Matter of fact, I tried to lie about many of my mistakes and it came lie after lie after lie. I didn't remember what the lie was in the first place. <laughs> Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. And I think that's the worst thing that we do at times. True, we try to cover up our mistakes. True, we try to cover it up. But then we go running from God. When God wants to help us, when God wants to direct us, even though... We messed up. He still loves us. He still wants to help. But yet we go running in the opposite direction. So the Lord God called out to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Then he asked, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman gave me, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is it you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, and I, you see how the trickle down effect happens? See how the trickle down effect happens? Okay, it was man's covenant with God not to eat from the tree. But he's like, no, it was my wife. The woman you gave, matter of fact, he's like, the woman you gave me, she did this. And then, and then the woman's like, well, the serpent deceived me. See the trickle down effect, how everything happened? So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any of the livestock. And any more than the wild, and more than any of the wild animals, you will move on your belly and eat the dust of the days of your life. Eat dust all the days of your life. It's kind of like when you're racing, you tell someone, "Eat my dust." The Lord's telling them, "You're you're going to be the worst of the worst. You're going to be the worst of the worst." He's letting them know right there. And here's the first promise I want to get. We're going to hit it real quick, but we're going to come back to it. I will put hostility, some of your translations may say enmity, between you and the woman, and between your offsprings and her offsprings. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And I, I want us to get in that for a little bit, because he put, he's going to put enmity, hostility, between the way it says her offsprings, and your offsprings. Uh, the book of uh, John, Jesus said, you belong to your father, the devil, and what you carry out, what you want to do, carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding truth to for what truth in him. When he lies, he speaks in a negative tongue, language, for he is a liar, and the father of liars. See, when he's talking about two offsprings of the woman and the serpent, he's talking about two different type of people. He, he, he's, 
I believe making a declaration between good and evil right at the beginning of the Bible. We learn there's going to be two types. There's going to be light and darkness right at the beginning. He says that right now he's declaring war. And this is a war that's going to end up being paid in blood. We took the, the offering today. We took the uh, communion today, which we recognize as the blood of Jesus. We recognize that as the blood that we are covered by. And God right now is making a declaration. Throughout time, there are going to be good and evil. And then he goes on to make a promise to him. He says, and, uh, he will strike your head and you will strike the hill, his hill. So there's another twofold event. There's another twofold event, and I believe because this is questioned throughout all theologic, all, all scholars all over the place, and I, I, I truly believe that one of the strikes happened, but the next one's bound to happen in the second coming, and it kind of already started, but we could get more into that later. Like I said, I'm going to hit that a little bit later. He said to the woman, I will in." Testify your labor pain. You will bear child with pain effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorn and thistle for you, and you will eat the plants from the field. You will eat the bread by the sweat of your brow until, 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 you return, until you return from the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made clothes from skin for the man and his wife and clothed them. And that's one of the one things that I, I want us to capture was 21. You know, after all this, for every action, there's a reaction. And they were in paradise. They had everything. They had a luxury life. They had an eternal life. Like I said, God created them a piece of heaven right here on earth and gave it to them. And they forfeited it all by one desirable pleasure. Forfeited everything. And we remember they went running because they were living life naked. They tried to cover up with fig leaves. They tried to do everything to cover up. But God's compassion is still, he still made them clothe out of animal. Some believe this is our flesh. Others believe it's uh, maybe some type of first offering. But the fact of the matter is God still, God still clothed them. But the one thing I want you to learn is that it's a temporary clothing at this point. It's a temporary, there's still a price that needs to be paid. We learn throughout the Bible, through, for the wages of sin is death. And that's what man was given. He was given death now. He would, from, from the dust of the earth he was created, and now he would go back to dust at one point eventually. The Lord God said, Since man has become like us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the garden of Eden to work the ground in which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim, a flaming, whirling sword, and, and the flaming, whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way of the tree of life. So that was the exit of man from the garden. That was the exit of man from a piece of heaven. Man would had to depart. You know what that truly was the exit of? It was the exit from Adam and God's walk in the garden together. 
You see, the serpent that came in that day, in his mind, he won a quick battle. He won a quick battle because his deception, because his lies, he was able to bring death upon this earth. He was able to bring death upon this earth. But there was a declaration that good and evil will fight. In 315, it was a declaration, and it comes out right after these two have kids. Their first two kids happen to be Adam and Cain, or Cain and Abel, Adam and Cain. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. And Cain would work the ground, like the Lord said. Abel tended the flock. See, they both brought offerings to God. They both brought offerings to God. See, Cain brought one that he produced with hands, his work. Abel brought some of the firstborn, some unblemished. Some unblemished. And Cain's offering fell incomplete. It fell short. But he, he worked his hands. He did all oh, oh, he did. Abel did with bring a sheep. He didn't have to plow the land. He didn't have to plant the right. But Cain's Foul incomplete. Because if the wages of sin is death, the only thing that could that could be a down payment for the sin we'll learn throughout time would be blood. That between put enmity between the woman and the serpent, it's gonna be a blood war. So that was the first offering, but we see it over and over when we fast forward to Adam or Abraham. Abraham was a man of God, and it says at one point in the Bible that faith with, uh, no, 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 no. A faith that can't be trusted, or a faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. A faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. And God asked Abraham to give up his one son, his son Isaac. And you got to understand the story of Isaac because at age almost 100, they, God told him that they're going to bear a son, him and his wife. And he promised them many nations to come out of that son. Now God's asking for his son back. God's asking the offering for his son. And he brought his son up. And just as he was about to do it, because he, he trusted the Lord, he had faith in the Lord, just as he was about to do it, God said, no. It's not your son. And he provided a ram, another offering of blood. And we see it over and over. We see it with Moses. When Moses had the Passover, as he's going to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, let my people go. One night the Lord tells him to go get some animals, put the blood above their doorposts, that he's going to send something so severe over the land, it's only going to pass over the ones that are covered by that blood. So they do it. They do it over and over. We see as a weekly offering, they were sacrificing animals. They said priests would come and drop the blood around the altars. But it was only a down payment. It was nothing that could fulfill the sin that was plaguing this earth. It was only a down payment. An unsatisfactory down payment as is, but it was still a down payment. Until a birth, a birth of a baby that didn't even have a bed to sleep in. A birth of a baby that we will come to know as the Prince of Peace. We will come to know as the living bread, or the, the everlasting bread, the living water. A, a, a baby that we come to know as our king, our savior. As a matter of fact, on Luke 2, 8 through 11, it says, And there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of a great joy 
that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And I want you to just think about that for a second. Because these are the angels. These are the angels. And I, I, as I look through their perspective, as I start to think, they must have been so excited because nine months prior, this God that we know, this Lord Jesus was on his throne and he just disappeared. He just disappeared. So they knew the angels were coming and they must have been so excited at this point because this was going to be God manifesting himself in the man. You see, God made himself lower than the angels because there was a debt that needed to be filled. There was a promise that needed to be fulfilled. So this birth was a birth of a promise to come to us. A blood so pure. It says in Jeremiah and uh, Isaiah, I believe, it says a blood so pure is going to be the Lamb of the living God. The Lamb of the living God. And even though the angels were so happy, there was still one out there. I didn't like it. Matter of fact, he, he had put it in people's head that they needed to go kill a bunch of babies before he even came. See, he, he recalls that declaration. He remembers those promises and he didn't want them to come forth true. And as the angels would watch, they would watch this baby grow. I could only imagine they were watching over him. They had to have been there when he was up at the mountain. After fasting for 40 days, see this one we call Jesus. After fasting for 40 days, he had the same attacks like Eve had in the garden. A seed of Eve had the same exact attacks. Tried to make Jesus doubt who he was. Tried to make Jesus question. He said, if you are really the son of man, if you are really the child of God, if you are really God's child, then turn these rocks into bread. At a time when Jesus had an appetite because he's been fasting, but over and over we see that Jesus won that with the word of God. He said man can't live off bread alone, but for every word that proceeds the mouth of God. He tried to tempt them over and over, took them to the, to the highest mountain. He said, I can give you fame right now. If you jump, certainly, certainly your angels would catch you and everyone would know you were God. He said, your, your angels will not let you crush your foot. He won't let a stone crush your foot. Man, don't that sound like the declaration of a hill being crushed? He said, your angels won't let that happen, do it. Jesus said, don't test God. Don't test God. Come on, somebody, don't test God. Amen. Then he took them. He said, okay, you know what? You're right. You're right. You are a king. And all these kingdoms can be yours if you just bow down in front of me. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, you better get out of here with that. I can picture that the angels were so happy when, when Jesus came out of that because that was a victory against the evil one. A victory against Satan. And as they watched them move forward and forward, they seen the healing. They seen blind eyes being able to see. They seen uh, dead people being raised to life. They got to see it all. And they watched with the smile. But it was a bittersweet smile because they knew that a time would come. A new that a time would come where a debt had to be paid. And, and as I think this, and you know, a lot of people will hear this and they're gonna say, Don't listen to anything Nick says because he's a false prophet. How can he think like an angel? How can but I can imagine if I was an angel, I, I would be clenching my fist as I have to watch my Lord get whipped. If I, if I have to watch him get spit at get mutilated, get cursed at, ridiculed. You know, these angels, like a picture, are ready to go because at any time, Jesus could have unleashed 
an army of angels, at least, uh, uh, what is, what is, what's the word, uh, of angels? Legions. legions of angels. At any time he could have released, uh, a legion of angels could have wiped the land clean. Matter of fact, he even told Pontius Pilate, he said, my kingdom ain't from this world because if it were, my servants would fight for me. Amen. He said, my servants would fight for me. So he took it. And I could see those angels having to watch. That was God in the flesh. Watch as they nail each hand to the cross. Watch as all the blood shed all over the place. They had to just watch, sit there and watch. And when they say obedience will always be better than a sacrifice, those angels were obedient. Because the true sacrifice was coming for each and every one of us. You know, as Jesus gave, and we have to understand that because he gave his last breath. I, I could picture there was still one that had a smile from ear to ear. There was still one that had a smile from ear to ear because, because before he, he uh, gave his last breath, he said, uh, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Tatalistai or Tatalisti, that it is finished. It is finished. And so the serpent, the evil one, Satan, whatever we want to call him at this point, he didn't really capture it. So he thought he claimed another victory. He thought that, that, that he really knocked the heel of our Lord, that he really crushed his heel at that point. You see, today I'm here to preach the gospel. That's the good news. That's not only the crucifixion of our King, the crucifixion of our Lord, but that consists of his burial as well. And that consists of his resurrection. Because on the third day, they went to go check. They had a sighting of Jesus. They went to go check the tomb. They rolled over this rock, which is crazy because it was, it was a huge rock. They said it take many men to roll it over. And guess what? We had Pastor Matt here the other day. And he told us that tomb was empty. He's been there. That tomb was empty. You see, God defeated death. The one thing that Satan had, the one thing that the enemy had on this land was death. We have to understand that. The wages of sin was death. But our Lord and Savior defeated it on that third day. When they rolled the tomb and he was no longer there. After the resurrection, he defeated the only thing the enemy had. And, and I want to stop for a second and I want to think, because now, now he still has sin over us, right? He still has sin over us because all those payments before, all the blood that was shed before was a temporary covering. But the Lamb of God, the blood so pure, the sinless one, was more than a down payment. It was a check cashed in in full for each one of us. Amen. You know, Brother Barry, I'm glad you're here because this guy, I told everyone 20 years ago at my work handed me a Bible. Yeah. Knee deep in my sin. I didn't see what God was doing then. I understand a little bit now. Yeah. He handed me a Bible and he would talk to me about God here and there. And, and I would listen, but I would try to contradict everything he would tell me, you know. He told me this one story, for some reason it stuck with me, 15, 20 years, whatever it was. He said, Nick, imagine in life you were born and you were given this jacket. And every time you go around the corner, every time life starts to act up, every time you start to fall short, you get a mark on this jacket. You go day in, day out with this jacket and there's new marks everywhere on this jacket. This jacket becomes so dirty. The shame of the jacket is so hard that it's even hard for you to wear it. He says what God does is he'll take that jacket. He'll take that jacket and he'll put it on his back. Your sin, 
It all got nailed onto the cross the day you accepted Jesus. Your sin got nailed on the cross the day you accepted Jesus. He said even better than this. Even better. He said even better. What God does is he gives you another jacket. An eternal jacket. Now you're going to leave from that place that day and you are going to get a mark. But it's a different jacket. It's a jacket of life. That's what yeah. he told me. That's something that stood there. You see, the blood of Jesus covered your sin. So as that evil one had a smile from ear to ear after the, the resurrection, that smile started to change. Because I could picture it at this point. I could picture him looking back, looking back, at the Garden of Eden, questioning himself now. Where did I go wrong? I saw the fall of man. I was the one that separated God and Adam from their walk in the garden. The one piece of heaven, I got rid of it. Well, he didn't know that Jesus brought heaven down to earth so heaven could dwell in me and you. And now when he looks, as he starts to see, he sees Brother Chris. Walking with God Amen. in their own personal garden, their own intimate garden. He sees Brother Jesse walking with God Amen. in their own intimate personal relationship in the garden. As he walks around and he looks, he starts to see everybody. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I wish I had a witness right now. You got to understand what the Lord sees all things. All things of the God work for the ones that love him. So even on a defeat, our Lord is still winning. Even on a defeat, what looks to the average eye, our God is still in charge. And we have to remember that. We have to remember that. So as Jesus gave, he gave his last breath. He gave it, right? He gave it. I want you to understand that. Bobby, do me a favor real quick. Take a deep breath. Jesus gave his last breath so Bobby could breathe freely. You have to understand that. You see, by the blood we are free. And by his resurrection we have life. Oh, man, wait, hold on, hold on. I got to put this down. Hey, can I get you guys to come up here real quick? Can I get you guys to come up here real quick? I don't even want to talk on the microphone because I, I told you I was going to show you some tactics of the enemy today. I told you I was going to show you the tactics of the enemy. I want you guys to understand because he don't change. He don't change. His ways of deception, his ways of lies, foolery, all that it stays the same. And I'm passionate at exposing his deception. I'm passionate at exposing because you got to understand we're in a fight. And this past week, you know, he came at me. He came at my family. And he used the same deception. He tried to attack my faith. He tried to question if I was going to do this or not today. He tried to make me doubt that I was even worthy of doing that. And he's going to do that to each and every one of us. When he attacks our faith, he's going to have us question our faith may even have us doubt our faith. But that's when we stand up and say, dirty devil, you can't have my faith because I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I know what the pain is was. I was paying in school. You have to understand that. So I just want you guys to shut your eyes. Let's focus on the Lord right now because I want to pray because I don't know what's going to happen when we leave here. This message right here, the enemy was trying to stop from the beginning. So I know he's going to be around. I know he don't like it. So, Father God, I thank you for what you're doing in this fellowship right now, Father. I just ask for a hedge of protection, Father, yes. as we move forward, Father. As, we, as you start to position us, Father, that you stay close to us, Father. That every evil lie that the enemy tries to put through our head, every single dark that he tries to shoot our way, that, that helmet of salvation will protect us, Father. Because it's through your blood we are saved, Father. And we thank you because you are salvation, Father. A blood so pure that could cover us all. We thank you for this walk that we all have in this garden, Father. This intimate relationship that we have with you, Father. 
Even when we don't understand what you are doing, we know you are still working. I thank you, mighty Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to ask the Patron family, all those that are related or indirectly related, to come right up here in the front. And uh, one of the ways that we combat the evil one is the Word of God. Is the Word of God. And so what I want to do is I want to pray a blessing for the Padron family. And also if you need a blessing, or you need to pray, go ahead and join us afterwards and we'll pray. But we are priests. The Bible makes it very clear that we do not need a mediator to be dressed in a black robe and a white cloth. Nothing wrong with dressing like that. But you're a priest, the Bible teaches. And he says you're a royal priest. So now we can uh, extend the Arianic blessing to them right now. Uh, numbers, and I'm using your Bible here. I want to use your Bible. Uh, numbers 6, 24 through 26, uh, Padron family, and all of us here. This is what the Lord said through the man of God, Moses. Tell them and his children, his family, this is how you're to bless the Israelites, the Padron family. Put your family right there and say this. Repeat after me. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine down on you, Padron family, and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor down upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Lord, we just thank you, God. We just pray the Arionic blessing over this family, uh, this man of God, uh, this woman of God. Uh, we combat evil with this right here, the book of God, the miraculous book. And Lord, we're believers, God, because we believe what this book says. And now, Lord, this hour, this moment, for all this family, God, some drove from afar off, and some drove uh, from nearby, but we pray, God, the blessings of of God upon their entire family, their household, their cousins, their relatives, yeah. and all those Lord indirect friends. We pray the blessings of God. Amen. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to ask Brother Dustin uh, to pray us out, but uh, unofficially, we're still here. Because if you need prayer, and maybe you need a blessing. I don't need too many people on the streets that refuse blessings. Remember I said, can I just grab a blessing for you? They seem to be like ready for that. Everyone needs a blessing. So, Dustin. Sure. Thank you, Lord, for the word that you brought brought forth today through my brother Nick. God. I pray that all the seed that was um, that was scattered today on the hearts in this house, I pray that it would take root, as you mentioned at the beginning, God. And right now, any enemy um, that's coming to try to pluck those seeds out of the hearts, I, I cancel your assignment right now in the name of Jesus. You have no authority. And right now, I set a hedge of protection around around those promises, Lord, that they would take deep, deep root in the hearts. Right now. And I thank you, Lord, that maybe uh, maybe our time today is is ending corporately, but I pray that we would just continue um, in you. And with one another, God, as we make our way um, through our lives and to the next time that we meet. And uh, can we just thank you, God. And be dismissed. Amen. 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 Not quite dismissed. We get to get one more song from Barbara. Yeah. One more song from Barbara.
Yeah. 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 Check one, two. Check one, two. All right, I didn't plan to do this song today, but after that awesome message from, from Nick, can we give it up for Nick? song really just kind of connects to the message today. It's called Sea of Victory.
are dismissed in the name of the Lord. And may the Lord be with you. And may you see many, many, many victories. And just one last thought on this brother's preaching today. They say that good preaching, when the hearer listens to good preaching, they think about Jesus. And they think about his blood, his resurrection. I don't know about you, but I know I'm going to think a little bit more about Jesus than I did from this preach, uh, from this sharing time. And that's what we want here on Sunday. We just want gospel-centered preaching based upon that book. And it's enough. It's enough. The gospel, the gospel will succeed wherever it's proclaimed. It'll, it'll, it'll flourish in communist China. It will flourish here in America. Wherever the gospel is preached and shared and lived out, it will succeed. It, you can count it. The Bible, the Bible promises that. So God bless you all, and thank you. Again.